<laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate it, and I appreciate you all coming out. So we're going to be talking a little bit about old media and new media. Old media is obviously newspapers, TV, and new media are things like blogging, Facebook, Twitter, social media. Um, there, during this current war, and it's obviously uh, you know very current topic. Things haven't quite ended yet, but there there's definitely advantages that the old media has when they're uh, when they're reporting the war. The the most obvious is that they're there on the ground. You know, new media typically isn't. You know, sometimes you'll be lucky and there'll be somebody you know that's there. You can interview somebody or you can get a, an email or something. But in general, the reporters are the ones that are on the ground. A lot of the most primary. Um, reporting really comes from the, from the old media. So we're really utterly dependent on the old media and the professionals to be able to get a lot of stuff done, which is a good thing and it's a bad thing. There's, uh, with the old media, there has been, um, at least until Fox came out, there has been a presumption of impartiality that, uh, you know, hey, it's you know, the New York Times, Time Magazine. If they say it, it must be true. They're definitely looking at all sides of the story. Uh, as blogging has becoming, you know, blogging and other social media has become more popular, we find that this is not quite true anymore. Um, the old media, especially, you know, again, the, the, the traditional media in Gaza has been spending an inordinate amount of time on emotional stories, and you can't blame them because this is the stuff that sells, this is the stuff that gets people interested. You have injured people, you have, uh, you know, people buried under rubble. It is uh, certainly a lot more compelling from a, from a TV perspective and from a storytelling perspective to be able to see stories like that and then to be able to um, say, you know, oh, and by the way, you know, people in Israel were a little bit scared, but Iron Dome knocked down a, a missile. They're, they're, you know, they're, media, by, its, uh, you know, by the way it works and by the, by the fact that it's a money-making operation, they want to be able to keep eyeballs, they want to be able to keep people on their side. Emotions win. You know, when you, get, when you pull at heartstrings, you're going to get more readers, more viewers. And uh, there's a disadvantage to that because, you know, the people that are viewed as victims are the ones that are going to be getting the more sympathetic coverage. Old media obviously still has the audience size. I mean, it's, uh, it may be diminishing over years, but it still dwarfs anything that happens in new media. Um, and again, there's obviously a, there's, there's a blurry line nowadays between the two. Uh, you know, old media has picked up new media functions. There are things that don't really fit in either category directly. You know, what is exactly Huffington Post? What's Slate? Uh, you know, they're, they're sort of, you know, they're professional, they're there, but you know, it seems firmly in the new media camp, but they have a lot of the disadvantages of old media as well. Um, but again, and, but clearly the old media still has a huge amount of power in that they choose what the stories that they're going to be talking about. And in many ways, they are the ones that choose what the narrative is going to be that everybody's going to be talking about with a story like the current Gaza war. And that's, that's hugely powerful and it's, it's a tough thing to fight against to be able to come up with a counter narrative. There are some advantages of new media though. Um, first of all, we can criticize the old media. The old media typically doesn't criticize itself. Newspapers, occasionally they pretend to, occasionally they'll do a little bit of, uh, of self-analysis, but in general they don't. They're, it's, it's an old boys club, they have groupthink, uh, you know, even different media, you know, when they're all stuck together in Gaza and there were uh, hundreds of journalists that were in Gaza during this past war. I, uh, Israel gave permission for about 450 and I believe there were more that came from Egypt and more that, were, that are local there already. So I think it was about 700 journalists were in Gaza, and you know, and they felt all hunkered down, and they were in hotels, and they're seeing the bombs coming, and they can't go anywhere, and they're, uh, you know, and they start thinking the same way. You know, if if one person goes out and does a story, then they all go out and do the story. If you look at some of the coverage of you know, of the TV coverage, there was one, you know, there was one scene that people might have seen of, uh, you know, a person giving a report, and then a rocket shows up in front of it. There were three different actual reporters that I've seen on video in the exact same spot, but different angles, so you couldn't see each other, with the same rocket. So they were all giving reports at the same time. They all go to the same places. They're all, they're all roughly doing the same thing. And uh, that's a problem, because they're, they're all following the crowd. They're not really, I mean, reporters are, you know, they're being paid, they do their jobs. If they manage to file their story by eight in the morning, they can go drinking the rest of the day. I mean, really, that's the, uh, that's the mentality. It's, uh, you know, getting to the truth. We like to romanticize reporters, and, you know, from old movies, you think, oh, reporters, you know, they're dedicated to this. There are very few of that nowadays. There really are. The reporters are, it's a job, okay, here it is, you know, and Gaza's great because you have a chance for a Pulitzer, especially photographers and, and video people. Hey, look at this, you have lots of dramatic scenes. And they're looking for that. They're looking for the Pulitzer more than they're looking for the truth. Um, making invalid assumptions. They, uh, the, a lot of the 
of the reporters that you would see that were covering Gaza, they weren't necessarily ever in Gaza before. They were ne not necessarily, you know, they came from, okay, they were in Bosnia last week, they were whatever. They don't know the history. They don't know the things that had happened before. And uh, to them, it's all new, and, it's, and they don't realize that the history really makes a difference. And, uh, and as we are gonna see in a minute, um, a lot of the things that happened, we've seen before for the people that know from the previous wars that happened in Gaza. It's always a reluctance, I mean, it's not just the media, but uh, it typically, uh, you know, for, for all liberals, there's a reluctance to, to criticize Islamism. I like to distinguish, other people don't, but I like to distinguish between Islam and Islamism, which is, uh, Islamism is more political. Islamism is a, you know, it's a political thought, it's a political process, um, it's a political philosophy, and as such, it should be criticized like any other political philosophy. There's no reason, you know, you want to you want to criticize communism, you want to criticize socialism. You can criticize Islamism, but people are reluctant to because, especially in Europe and America, it's like, oh, it's religion. You know, we don't want to get anybody upset. We're, you know, so that that that's another issue that comes up. Um, also, the the media, and not only the media, the NGOs will misstate international law completely. They really don't know anything about international law and they're going to, and they use, they, they say it wrong all the time and they make assumptions all the time. People who should definitely know better. Um, there was a tweet from Nick Kristof of the, of the New York Times last week, I think, or a week or two ago, in which he said, ah, there were, you know, 1,700 people killed by, uh, by Israel. The, the Palestinians only killed 60. That's disproportionate according to international law. It's like, no, it's not what disproportionate means. It's not exact, it's nothing. You know, what you said is a completely useless statement. And then it was retweeted by Ken Roth of Human Rights Watch, who as, and he should know better. And of course he doesn't because he has his own biases. And this is like, no, this is not what proportionate means. And, uh, but people say that and people start believing it and it's crazy. Other advantages of new media is that there you can people can look with a fresh eye. The people that are the other bloggers, the Facebookers, etc., tweeters, uh, they can do their own original analysis. They can look at historical context, and uh, sometimes we can get stories that were essentially what they call burying the lead. There could be a tiny detail in the middle of a story from the old media that ends up saying, you know, you know that little B detail really is the most important story or the most important part of the story. The best example was uh, the Washington Post relatively early in the war, maybe after a week or two, maybe right after the ground invasion, uh, they were you know, doing their typical story, but at the very, uh, right stuck in the middle, he said, and uh, Hamas's de facto headquarters is in Shifa Hospital. We, now, people that know from previous wars, they know this stuff, but it had never been reported. And that's sort of a big deal, because that means that Hamas was hiding their targets inside a hospital, which is against international law. I mean, that's like a big deal. And they all knew it, and the reporters all knew it. And he was the only one, except for this French reporter who uh, was essentially threatened for reporting it, there, he was the only one that really said it. And he threw it, he just like a tiny thing in the middle. So that's a, uh, so sometimes you can get great stories out of what they do report, and you have to read between the lines of what they are saying. Um, also, like again, rocket fire from near hotels. Sometimes they would bury it, especially the foreign reporters. They didn't have as much of a problem as the English-speaking reporters, because sometimes because the uh, presumably Hamas didn't understand Spanish or or uh, Swedish or whatever other languages they were doing. So you'll see sometimes you'll see some more honest reporting from the uh, from the foreign press that was in Gaza, which is very interesting. As soon as it began. Again, as I've been doing this for 10 years, and I've been covering uh, the, the previous Gaza wars, so I knew we saw this play before. I put out a, a post on July 8th saying, you know, I've seen this, this is what's going to happen. I know what Hamas is going to be doing. I wrote it, and it was a very popular article, and I thought that maybe, you know, because the first week or two, the coverage wasn't that bad when it was still the air war, and I thought maybe, you know, I got through, but unfortunately, the pull of the media being in Gaza and with, with, uh, with devastation around them sort of uh, took over their, their objectivity. But I wanted to try to tell the media ahead of time, here's what Hamas is going to try to do to fool you, because we've seen it. Number one, making the assumption that all the casualties are caused by the IDF. Um, my most shining moment actually came during uh, Pillar of Defense in, the, in 2012. Um, these two pictures that are on the bottom are two pictures of dead babies, which are always very popular. The first one was uh, Mahmoud Sadala. Um, you see that the Egyptian prime minister came over to Gaza. There was a slight ceasefire because Israel knew he was coming, so Israel held a ceasefire. He came over from Gaza, and I mean, he came over to Gaza from Egypt, and he saw, and they said, oh, look, here's a baby that just got killed. During the ceasefire, Israel fired, and this baby got killed, and he's like, oh, it was a big photo op.
Betelem, okay, in an interview, said, oh, we know, we, how do we know that they're civilians or militants? We ask the families. The families tell us, you know, we trust them. There's no reason they would be lying to us about what they're there. Um, there, there actually is a very big reason why the families would not be telling the truth. And uh, I think I mentioned this uh, actually on a later slide, but uh, there's, uh, how many of you have heard that Hamas actually gave instructions right in the beginning of the war to, to people that are going to be talking to the media and stuff like that, the Hamas interior ministry gave out specific instructions on YouTube and on Facebook saying, here's what you say. Everybody's an innocent civilian. Every time you talk to somebody, mention the, uh, you know, mention the number of casualties. Every time, say that it's, you know, it's from Israel. Thing. If you have to mention rockets, say that they're homemade rockets. Never show film of our people firing rockets. Never show pictures of our terror. Those were instructions. How many, of us, how many of you have heard about this? Okay, most of that's good. Because uh, I, I don't know when I, you know, I'm into it, but I don't know how many people are into it, so this sort of thing. So yes, there's very good reason why these families are telling, you know, the, the NGOs, the Western NGOs that are coming in, they're, you know, they're not even Western, but they're telling NGOs, they know who they're talking to. There's very good reason why they're selling and saying everybody's a civilian. In a few months, yes, they're gonna be recognized as martyrs. Yes, they're gonna get paid for it. Um, there's, uh, Double counting of deaths, um, I was going through some of the lists and I've seen double and triple counting of the same people's names. Um, nobody, as I said before, nobody's really investigating how many uh, deaths have been from Hamas rockets. We do know of a couple of cases for sure. There was uh, one major misfire of a Hamas rocket that hit the, what's called the beach camp, the Shati camp in Gaza and uh, 10 people were killed, nine of them kids. Um, and as far as I can tell, those are all being counted as being killed by Israel. There's um, uh, crossfire. I mean, there's battles that are going on in Gaza. That when you know during the ground war, Israel's not shooting at nobody. You know, Hamas is shooting back. Hamas is shooting mortars. Hamas is shooting anti-tank weapons. Those shells go somewhere if they miss the Israelis. Um, in fact, Hamas has been using their rockets against Israelis as well. They've been actually shooting these Qassam rockets at the Israeli forces. If they miss, they're hitting somebody or something. Um, but nobody, and then there's nobody, nobody's going to investigate because there's nobody in Gaza that's willing to, or that's going to even, you know, that's going to take the time or the effort, and it's a lot of energy to be able to do an investigation for every person. But nevertheless, you know there are some. It's got to be in the dozens. It may be, you know, as I would guess. I'm just guessing based on previous times because I know there's been lots of misfires. You know, it may be as many as 100. Work accidents. Um, this happens a lot. I've been counting those as well. Between the beginning of this year and the war, about 30 people in Gaza have been killed, either from misfired rockets or from what's called work accidents. The jihadists are working on a bomb and it blows up on them, or a rocket that uh, blows up on the uh, on the launch pad. Um, you know, usually it's the, the 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 terrorists that are getting killed, but sometimes it killed innocent people. That was without a war going on. That's with with they when they have time to shoot the rockets the way they want to, and when they have time. Who there was a work accident with four. Um, Hamas people killed just a few days ago during the ceasefire. Who knows how many of these things happened during the war? I mean, you know, when, when it's in the heat of battle. Natural deaths, there's some evidence, it's, uh, it's hard to get actual numbers on this, but there certainly was evidence during cast lead that natural deaths were being blamed on Israel. Um, there was a, uh, there's like a, again, the, the Gaza Health Ministry in, 19, in 2008, 2009 would come up with, you know, here are the people that died of certain causes, heart attack or whatever during the, you know, during the month. And in January 2009, the number went down to zero uh, during the war. So there's some evidence that, uh, that these people are being counted as being killed by Israel. Collaborators, there are stories out there, and it seems fairly well sourced, that uh, Hamas is using this war as a reason to kill people that are their political rivals or people that they suspect of being spies. But in the articles that, they, you know, that are talking about it, and I see, again, I've seen this in the Arabic articles, they'll say, because the families have some very good you know, terrorists, and they're not terrorists, but you know, very good people that are in there, you know, well-known people that we love, we don't want to embarrass them, so we just put the bodies into the morgue. And that's it. They won't, see, they won't publicize who are the ones that they're killing. Obviously, when they're in the morgue of the hospital, they're being blamed on, the deaths are being blamed on Israel. Oh, great. Um, and uh, also they're being used as human shields. There have been reports of uh, Fatah, again Fatah is the, is the rival of Hamas, and uh, there have been, uh, Hamas has shot Hamas members in the legs and said, Put, we're putting you under house arrest, but when they're under house arrest, that means if Israel sends out leaflets and says, you gotta leave, they can't. 
Um, and there have been some reports of, of protesters being killed. I haven't verified that. And other reports that uh, Hamas has killed people who dug tunnels and worried that they're collaborators and they're going to tell Israel where some of the tunnels are that Israel might not have known about yet. Okay. There's, um, now, there's a, there's a problem with all media. This is not just a, a, an old media thing, but everybody has a problem admitting their mistakes. And it's, it gets worse with the old media than the new, but everybody has this problem because we're all human. So there's a narrative. There's a narrative that the, uh, that the old media has about Israel. They'll say things like, you know, Israel's extreme right-wing government, or things about occupation, or that uh, Fatah are the good guys and Hamas are the bad guys. Fatah's been shooting rockets, too, in, uh, you know, in, in Gaza. This is an issue that nobody really wants to talk about. Even Israel doesn't want to talk about it because they have to have security cooperation with these guys. So they don't want to embarrass them. But the fact is, hundreds of rockets are in, you know, were shot by who were supposedly the good guys, people that report to Mahmoud Abbas, the, that great peacemaker. He hasn't tried to stop them. There's no indication whatsoever that he wants to stop them. Um, so, and how many stories were in the war? I mean, the fact is, one of the things that, that really hasn't been reported is Israel's support for the war has been completely across the board. Even the most left-wing Israelis, excepting a couple of our uh, reporters, uh, the most left-wing Israelis have been completely for this war. People you have never say this, they're saying, we have no choice, what is this? Absolutely, but that's the story that hasn't been in the media either. So for them, for the media, the, for, this, for the old media, the narrative is what must be protected, not challenged, because they've spent so much time building up these, these memes, essentially, that are shortcuts, so they could just refer to the shortcuts because it's too hard for them in a story to make things complicated. So they've already spent all this effort in saying, this is the way it is. This is, the, this is our framing of how things are. Yes, Bibi is a right-wing zealot. He's just as bad as the people on the other side. Everyone's equal. And therefore, and it's just you know, it's a fighting over war, or over land, or religion, or whatever. And that's what they have. And that's, that's the way it is. But uh, you know, the new media also has ideological blinders. I'm not saying everybody, you know, that, it's, that it's only the old media. To my mind, um, the best way uh, of t t finding that somebody is credible is when they're willing to admit mistakes. There's, uh, everyone's really afraid of, you know, of saying that they made a mistake. But the fact is, when they do admit a mistake, people don't realize that's what enhances their credibility. That's not what destroys their credibility. And that's a very simple rule, and it's one that I try to, uh, to keep on my blog. And, uh, and nothing erodes credibility more than trying to cover up the mistake. So, and so when they, sometimes the media will make a mistake and then they'll change. And this happens, it's not just sometimes. Um, this happened to the BBC today was with, with an article. It was, uh, I mean, there's actually, um, there's a great website called Newsdiff that takes a number of major uh, news media, you know, like New York Times, Washington Post, a few things, and it'll show how stories change through the day. It checks, you know, and it's just amazing when you're looking at this sort of stuff, you know, how things just, the shading changes and the meanings change and certain quotes that are really important disappear afterwards. It's very, very interesting. Uh, the BBC had um, an article talking about, you know, hey, maybe we should relook at the civilian casualties because statistically it is a huge number of, of young men that are being killed compared to the number of young men that are in Gaza. They just rewrote it a little bit in which it's, well, maybe Israel's targeting young men. You know, it's just weird things like that. It's very strange. So, um, but that, so it's sort of like a cover-up. And nothing erodes credibility than, you know, than trying to cover things up. And nothing enhances credibility than saying, you know, hey, we really screwed up. Did the mainstream media admit their mistakes? Sometimes now, as I was saying, we've seen some articles. Now, after the 30 days, you know, whatever, of the war, now they're during the ceasefire, sometimes you'll see them saying, oh, there were some rocket launchers in populated areas. We did see them occasionally. There were, you know, or the statistical analysis I just mentioned, or a couple of reporters do report being intimidated, although some of them still deny that they were. Um, but it's not a mea culpa. It's not they're saying, oh, we were wrong. They're saying, no, we're looking at it in a new way, and we're doing more in-depth reporting now. But they're not admitting that what they were saying for the 30 days was, was, was really wrong. Um, they, and they, but I believe firmly that they modified their coverage, at least they're doing the slight bit of backtracking because of pressure from bloggers and tweeters and, and et cetera. Because we've been hammering at them for the whole time saying, you know, what are you doing? You know, you're telling me that Hamas isn't firing rockets? We see them going into Israel. They're coming from somewhere. You're telling me that there are no militants shooting stuff? Israelis are being killed. You know, there, 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 there's stuff going on. You can't ignore it. And, uh, so they, and they were shamed into it, which is really the only way. So reluctantly, they started doing it. But it's still, it's too little too late. I made this uh, little graphic. Um, saying, you know, here's, uh, here's how it looked like for the first few days, you know, had great headlines, you know, IDF war crimes, heartbreaking photos, you know, that's what it was for weeks. And then all of a sudden at the very end, hold on, we just discovered some new information. It's going to take a while. We're going to have to research this to find out the truth. You know, you can't, 
It's an emotional game. You can't override all the emotions and all those pictures and all of the other coverage that they have. You can't be overridden in you know, just saying in a tiny little article saying, well, we're going to be re-examining this a little bit. This is a sort of ugly uh, diagram, but I think that this is my, my perception of how I think, uh, I, I think it's reasonably accurate of, of trying to compare the, all the different types of media. Um, the size of the circles is, again, not to scale by any means, but it's uh, roughly the size of the audience. And uh, the, the top, you know, things that are on the top half are the ones that generate more news. The ones on the bottom half are more the ones that like forward existing news. So the mainstream news media obviously is still the 800 pound gorilla in the room. They generate the most news, they get the most eyeballs. Um, there's secondary media, the things that I'm talking about, things like you know, Huffington Post or uh, Times of Israel, um, which is you know, semi-blog, semi-news, um, that, that, that is getting some, some play over there that do generate stuff. NGOs and governments that put out press releases, pretty much everything they put out is considered news to some extent or another, so they're not really copying anything, but they, uh, the stuff they put out almost all gets into the headlines in some way or another. Um, then there's blogs, which are a much smaller audience, but, uh, and again, a lot of blogs are also repeating other people's stuff, but there is some original stuff coming from blogs. YouTube is actually very big. One of the things I've been doing a lot during this war would I be taking um, videos from, that people wouldn't see, you know, from Israeli media that would only be in the Israeli websites, and I would download them and upload them to YouTube, or, um, or from other sites too, just, you know, just, you know, because YouTube is where the audience is. That's where the people want to watch videos. They all want to see it in one place. Um, so, uh, and it's, so it's hugely influential. I get many, many more hits on, on some of my YouTube videos than I do on the blog. Uh, Facebook is, of course, huge, and they're, again, they're, some Facebook outlets you know, do, uh, do have original stuff, and most of the stuff are, are people just liking or, or, or recopying stuff. And then there's Twitter, um, which is actually hugely important, and we will talk about that in a minute. To, to my mind, the success for, to, to the criteria for success for new media, for the bloggers and for the Facebookers and, and things like that, one is uh, meter surpassed journalistic standards. You know, we, you know, there are standards in journalism, and there's no reason why everybody shouldn't hold by these standards. If you hear a rumor, at least make clear that it's a rumor, show where the rumor came from, try to do some checking to see whether it makes sense or not. Um, Admit your bias up front. Everybody's biased to some extent. The news media pretends that they're unbiased, but it's not true. Everybody has a bias. So it's easier if you say, hey, here's where I'm coming from. You know, if you don't want to believe me based on that, fine. But, and this is, this is what I try to do. I try to be, since I'm anonymous, I want to be as transparent as possible. That's how I try to make up for my anonymity, because it can't be my reputation. So it can't be because of my name. It can't be because I'm a famous reporter. I'm not Thomas Friedman. I'm not anybody like that. But I could say, look at my stuff. I'm, if, if you're asking me where I'm getting something from or how I come to this conclusion, it's all there. It's either in the links or I explain it exactly out there. That transparency should make up for reputation. Um, so new media's job also is to publicly expo expose the mistakes that are done in the old media and then the, the misrepresentations, the lies, um, to shame the mainstream media as we were talking about, to push content uphill so again, the mainstream media is what's on the left, and I'm saying you know, the other media is more to the right. We want to push stuff into the mainstream media, and sometimes it works. You know, sometimes they have no choice to, to say, hey, we have to cover the story because it was covered by, they might not give credit, they usually don't, or they're gonna look at it independently, but nevertheless, sometimes the angles are compelling enough that it gets pushed, pushed towards the left-hand side in this, in this thing. And, and to increase the size of the audience of new media itself is um, you know, to get more, more and more eyeballs on the new media to be able to say that, hey, this is just as credible as being able to read some of the old media or as an adjunct. It doesn't really matter. You can, I'm not saying you know, don't read you know, the New York Times, don't read the Washington Post. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that uh, look, at other, look, you know, look at plenty of the other guys that are out there that are doing good stuff, guys and girls. Twitter is really incredibly important. And this is what the bottom arrow is, and Facebook to a smaller extent, but Twitter is the equalizer for all of this stuff. The, the reporters are all on Twitter. The news media is all on Twitter. And they read their tweets because they're insecure like, they're, like everybody is. So they want to know what people are saying about them. So they, so everybody, not just bloggers, but everybody can say, you screwed up, or why didn't you cover this? Or look at the bias you have over there. And when it's a good point, 
they'll answer. They'll defend themselves. Judy Ruder of the New York Times, she'll answer her tweets, you know, and, uh, you know, Eamon Mohanson or whatever his name is from NBC. I mean, these people are, you know, they're sensitive. They're going to say, no, here's the reason I did it. Here's a, but sometimes this is, you know, they, they have no choice but to at least cover what people are talking about, what people are asking about her. And they'll co go back a couple days later sometimes and say, oh, by the way, here's another angle or something like that. That was really pushed by the t Twitter. Really, really huge thing. Um, there, and their bosses read the, the criticisms as well. So it's, uh, it's really, really a big deal, especially when things get retweeted a lot. Um, it's really replaced email as a communication. I mean, email is still very effective. When people get an email, they take it, you know, they take it much more seriously. The few people that actually get uh, snail mail, that's really, really important. But uh, not too many people have the time to do that nowadays. But, uh, but Twitter right now is just a e very easy way to be able to get people's attention, to get the, the attention of the media and say, Hey, what are you doing? I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll ignore a lot of it, but they, they won't ignore it forever. So, ah, I'm going reasonably fast. The, uh, the promise of the new media really is in the power of the audience. The, um, so like I said, Twitter is great for uh, equalizing new media, and Twitter isn't you know, just by itself, because things like Storify and Twitchy, sometimes Twitter turns into the story. Again, the, an example from uh, Human Rights Watch, as I was mentioning before. Ken Roth of Human Rights Watch, who clearly has an anti-Israel agenda. He denies it up, to, up, up and down, but he clearly does. And, and his tweets prove it. It's the, the stuff he's been tweeting has been amazing. He'll say things. He's going out of his way, which is amazing. For a human rights researcher, he goes out of his way to minimize Hamas's war crimes. He'll say things like, you know, like I mentioned before about the human shields. He says, well, if it's not, you know, even though the, human re the, the law is pretty clear, he says, well, if it's not forced to be there, then they're not considered human shields. He said, um, the tunnels that are going into Israel, if they were meant to snatch civilians, then it might be a war crime, but if it's meant to, to snatch soldiers, then it's not. It's not true. You know, if you look at the Geneva Conventions, there's one article that says very flatly, hostage taking is considered, is, you know, is completely unacceptable. Is, is war. It doesn't say soldiers, not soldiers. He made that up. But uh, so you could put together all of his tweets and turn it into a story. You could turn it into a blog post. You could turn it into say, look at all these things that he's saying. It turns into news by itself. So, uh, but even an individual tweet could be uh, a big deal. There were a couple of other stories. Um, two times, twice, in the Wall Street Journal. Once one of them took a picture of uh, a press conference in that same Shifa hospital that was Hamas's headquarters. He took a picture of like this one guy, with Hamas, you know, a major Hamas figure, um, giving a press conference or doing an interview in, in front of a backdrop that was a makeshift studio that was in the hospital. And he tweeted, I wonder what the patients think when they see something like this. Within an hour, it was gone. It was like, clearly he was threatened, clearly he took it down. That's a story. He put up a tweet and he took it down. Um, another Wall Street Journal reporter, similar thing, he took, um, I mentioned the two rockets that, uh, that clearly were, you know, that killed people, that one, one hit that beach camp, one, one of them also hit an outside wall at Shifa Hospital. I don't remember if there were any casualties then. But they, um, he tweeted, he said, looking at this, it looks like it's probably a Hamas rocket by the amount of damage it caused. And again, within an hour, he took it down. Which is, a, that's a story, that's a big deal. So Twitter itself can sometimes generate stories. We also need people to help push out the correct, you know, alternate news. I'm saying every alternate news. Obviously, there are a lot of there's you know a lot of unreliable uh, alternate news for sources or new media that's out there. There's not the same checks and balances. Really, I mean, there is some. There are some checks and balances in the news media. There's bias, and the bias goes all the way up. But nevertheless, there are some checks and balances that don't exist with blogging. So you have to be careful. Um, but also, again, speaking of something like Twitter, the other side, the anti-Israel side, has a lot of people. As you know, if one person that's you know one of their leaders says, "Oh, let's start a new trend." hashtag, you know, Gaza under fire or something like that. Immediately thousands of people are going to do it. We'll never win that war because there are way too many of them than there are of us. But there are plenty of things that we can do. Again, bugging the reporters, bugging politicians, doing things like that and, and, uh, and retweeting, um, the, you know, the articles that you think are good is actually makes a big difference. So retweet liberally. Um, and it's not only Twitter. There are things like Reddit is actually fairly huge uh, that uh, you know people will take articles and put them on Reddit that they like. And uh, you know I get a lot of hits when people do that. It's uh, you, it really does make a difference. And sometimes there's some interesting research that's being done. You know, sort of crowdsourcing research that could be done in, in Reddit. Um, Email and complaints is also, again, still works. It's still very effective, um, both to the media and to NGOs. 
because they're, you know, there's a bias there. And so, you know, emailing them, you know, they, they'll sometimes give you an answer. They don't really have a choice. You know, they're, uh, they can be shamed. There's a, um, and, you know, and occasionally it's something that, you know, they just can't ignore. There was a, uh, a case that, uh, again, this is, you know, I'll remember mine better than other people's, but there's a case where uh, I noticed last year that uh, right before Passover, there was a, um, there's an NGO called MIFTA, which is a, uh, you know, again, a Palestinian NGO in the West Bank. And they had news articles, they have their own things, you know, they have, they have their own section. And this one person wrote on MIFTA saying that, oh, by the way, the Jews, you know, slaughter Christians, and they drink their blood for, you know, their matzahs. That's the way it is, in Arabic. Uh, and I made a big stink over this. And uh, I didn't just make a big stink, but I told my readers, hey, don't just complain to MIFTA. But here are the people that fund MIFTA. Here are all the NGOs that give money to MIFTA from, you know, Anna Lind Foundation and the Conrad, whatever, you know, all these you know, the organizations that give, so ask them if this is okay with them. And MIFTA got very, for the first couple of days, MIFTA was saying, you know, who's this guy, Elder of Zion, he's, he's, he's just an obscure blogger, we don't care. He, they wrote that, they wrote that in, their, uh, in English in their, uh, in their reply. Um, and finally, when they started getting heat from their funders, then they pulled the article and then they wrote an apology only in English, even though the article was in Arabic. The Arabic people have no idea why the article was gone. But, uh, but in English, they wrote an apology in order to be able to get these people off their back. But it did make headlines. You know, this, this, this weighted into, uh, into wire services around the world. It's like, hey, again, there's, because you, know, you need to have a sustained campaign in order to be able to make a big difference for them, but it's still a difference. It's still a victory. It's not as good as we would like because these guys are clearly, you know, I, I, you know, I went further. I saw, hey, other articles these guys have in which they're supporting terror. Is that okay with all you guys, with the, with you funders? And then I found another one in which they say, you know, we we do, we do not support normalization with Israel. We will not talk with Israelis. And I'm like, all these other foundations are spending their money trying to come up with, um, you know, dialogue and, and all these other things. And these guys are saying they're exactly against dialogue. Is that a problem for you guys? So sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But it's 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 worth complaining. It's worth uh, bringing up the ladder. But it's not something I can do myself. You know, it's not uh, you, you need a, tr a crowd of people to do it. Everybody has their own niche. Everybody has something they're good at. Whether you know you might be good at videos, you might be good at Twitter, you might be great at Facebook, you might go to whatever you're good at. Um, you know, use that. There's always a way to fit it in. There's a, you know, whether it's letter writing, whether it's writing to politicians, or whether it's, uh, you know, pulling levers or talking to people that you know that you have contact. There's always a lever. Everybody has something that they can do to contribute in order to be able to fight this bias that's out there against Israel. And it's a huge amount. And it's uh, so, you know, everybody has to think about what their own skills are. I'm not, you know, don't just do anything you don't. Know, do it whether you're fun. You know, do it. if it's fun for you, do something. If it's something you're good at, do it. But there's there's plenty of skills that you know every skill can be used in one way or another to be able to help Israel. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.